So how's everybody doing? I think I already asked you that. Never mind. Um, so tonight we're going to do pharmacology. Um, one thing to... Um, So pharmacology, we're going to talk about medications. We're going to talk about the study of medicines. Uh, one of the things that we have to worry about with medicines is that we're putting a substance into a person and it can have severe consequences. Um, not just because of what they can do, uh, because at the EMT level, they don't let us do too much. Now, it does depend on the system as to what we're going to be able to do, but uh, it, it, it does depend. Uh, but it's more of, are they allergic to something or are they taking something else that might interfere with, with what they're taking? Okay, hold on. Can you guys hear me? Okay. So, 
anyway, um, so with medications, we have to learn about, um, the medications that we're going to give, we're going to talk about the different parts of medications and also about um, when we do our assessment, we get a history. Uh, we, we're going to determine how they are, or I'm sorry, what kind of medications they're going to give um, to make sure that it's okay to give it in that case. Anyway, we can't see you, Lou. Yeah, I know. I want to see you. It's okay. <laughs> I just to see what it feels like. Today we're going to talk about administer medications. We're going to talk about uh, the medications that we commonly administer or even assist with administering. Uh, we'll talk about medication names, routes of administration, the forms, uh, some essential medication information, uh, things that you need to be aware of, um, key steps in administering medications, things to worry about, uh, also reassessing after administration. Uh, administering medication, uh, and finally, uh, sources of, of medication information. Um, so first off, uh, we have an EMT that approaches the patient, and he sees that the patient who's sitting on the ground is leaning forward to support himself with his hands, is in respiratory distress. Okay, so leaning forward to support himself with his hands, that's, that's called what? Tripod. That's tripoding. So, um, so you have a patient a uh, who's a teenage boy does not acknowledge his presence and appears pale and sweaty. Hurry, ex exclaims the woman kneeling next to the boy. He's allergic to bees and he was stung by a wasp. I don't know how to use his epi uh, uh, epinephrine injector. So, uh, what is your initial impression of how serious the uh, patient's condition is? So he's tripoding, he's pale, and he's diaphoretic. So that that's letting us know that that he's having some issues. And so uh, we have a, a a poor initial general impression of of this child. And then as far as epinephrine be beneficial to to a patient, uh, it has what. Uh, Actually, we, we've covered this before. It has the beta-1, uh, or actually uh, the alpha-1 and the beta-2 properties, uh, where it's it's vasoconstricting and, and uh, bronchodilating. So it's going to close off the blood vessels. Um, therefore, the, the capillaries are not leaking. It's improving the blood pressure. It's putting the, uh, improving the cardiac output. And then also... Uh, it, it's broke, opening up the bronchioles by, and allows more oxygen to go into the alveoli. So it is very, very, very beneficial. Uh, what would you need to know about epinephrine before administering it? Pro. The main thing is that it's not expired. Um, so remember as EMTs, we're, we're going to assist 
in the administration of medications. There are places where you can administer, but the medications that you can administer are very, very limited. Okay. Uh, there, you have to have the understanding of medications. Uh, you have to under, understand what they call the pharmacokinetics uh, the pharmacokinetics of medications uh, because they do have effects on the body. Okay. Um, there's there's a medication I can give that I could stop your heart. And so I have to understand what that medication does, what the correct dosage is, and how to properly administer it. Uh, for EMTs, um, actually, here's here's a an example. I, I had a, a call a couple weeks ago, and we had a patient with kidney stones. Granted, this was a big guy, and uh, I wanted to help him out with with his pain. And normally, narcotics are reserved for paramedics to administer. And I had an advanced EMT student riding uh, riding along. And um, I, I thought, well, I'm in here, and you know, there's others that that let them administer it. I drew it up, so there wasn't a danger of that. <clears throat> Plus, I have to I have to account for uh, pretty much every drop of that narcotic anyway. So uh, I prepped it, and I gave it to her, and I said, give him two milligrams of morphine, and she repeated it back to me. Okay, two milligrams of morphine. And I said, make sure you give it slowly. Well, next thing I know, she's giving me back the syringe and it's empty. And my heart dropped. I said, this is not good. And I wasn't a happy camper. Because what can morphine do to you? It depresses your breathing. Exactly. It knocks out your breathing. And so now I have to keep an eye on his breathing. I, I got into my bag. I grabbed the Narcan. And um, I had it ready to go just in case his respiratory rate dropped. Uh, fortunately, she didn't flush the medication afterwards, so it stayed in his uh, what we call saline lock. Uh, so afterwards is, is when um, I told her to push it nice and slow, or I might have done it, I don't remember. Um, or no, I think I did after that point. Um, and so we didn't have the effect that we could have had. So, uh, so I'm very particular about letting EMTs do drugs because there's a lot to learn about the drugs and even my advanced students I test the hell out of them with drugs now it was my, my mistake because I didn't teach her better so that was a lesson learned um, understand that we're, when you're administering medications you're administering them under medical direction Okay. You're administering them under medical direction. Um, all right. So, start off with medications. Uh, medication is a drug. It's a chemical that we use to, to treat or prevent a disease or a condition. So, if you take any medications on a normal basis, that's, that's a chemical. You're introducing chemicals to alter your body chemistry, your, your, your body function, uh, to get a desired effect. Now... Uh, now the study of drugs we call that pharmacology and so that's a that's a class that 
And that's what this class is about today. And everyone has a pharma pharmacology and they throw a lot more stuff in there. Um, now, what you what you help administer, there are some that, that are carried on your ambulance. Uh, usually the rule of thumb is if it's not carried on your ambulance, you cannot give it. So um, we have a we have a, a, a BLS bag for, for the EMTs that has a, a little med uh, med box and it just includes nitro and aspirin um, and albuterol. I, th I think that's all it is. So we talked about how when you give a medication, it has an effect on the body. We're, we're hoping you give it correctly, we have a positive, uh, positive effect. If it's given inappropriately, then we could have some serious side effects. We talked about morphine, how it can cause, uh, and even without it, uh, it, will, it could still um, slow down your, your respiratory rate. But there's, there's medicines that um, can drop your blood pressure. It could speed up your heart too much. Okay. So. Um, Okay, like I said, we only we only assist or administer that which our medical director allows us. Uh, um, we don't we don't take anything from the from uh, somebody else. Um, I was gonna say we don't take anything the patient gives us, but we can. Um, What about just over the counter? I mean, it's not like give it to them, but maybe suggest it or you have you have to be very careful when you do that because you're opening yourself and the medical director up to liability. Now, over the if it's your family member, you say, "Mom, take some, some take some Tylenol." Okay, that's one thing. But if you're somewhere else and you're telling them, oh, yeah, take some Tylenol, well, not necessarily a good thing. So you're right. What about over the counter? Not all over the counter is good. Like, do you take Advil or Motrin or Aleve or Naperson? Yes. Okay. Do you do anything before you take those? Mm, what do you mean? Like, no. Usually I mean, eat something? No, I, I want to know from him. Oh. Does he do anything in particular before he, he pops into his mouth? No, I honestly don't. Okay, just... then then that, that could be an issue because as Vanessa was saying, you have to eat something before. It could, oh, it could wow. mess up stomachs and can cause ulcers. So you need to tell them to take it with food or take it with milk. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. So you see see what I'm saying is we, we can't just tell somebody, you know, lay public, go ahead and do this because they're, they're going to be, they're going to want to sue you um, mm -hmm. um, or they may sue you. Uh, but if you tell your, your deal, you know, you just call you a pinche garron or something like that. All right. Was, <laughs> that just, was that just my uncle? No, it's pretty much all Mexican uncles. Okay. True. I do that too. So.
Okay. So, mm. so what if the patient, there's whatever medication, oh, I'm on a, I got this medicine over here. It's over my bedroom though. Let me go get it. She do I allow him to, to go get it. No. No, it could actually make him worse. Make him worse, make him get <laughs> get more pain. So um, the, the main thing is become familiar with your local protocols. Okay. Um, so as far as medications go, the first one, we wouldn't think that it is a medication, but it is. And that's oxygen. Okay. Um, did, I, did I ask you guys before about, did I ask you to bring in a doctor's note saying you can breathe our oxygen? No. Okay. What's the difference from the oxygen that you're breathing in right now to the oxygen that we give patients? Could it be that the oxygen we give patients is 100%? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's the the concentration that that we administer as opposed to what we're breathing in the ambient air so six uh 21 versus 100 uh, percent so oxygen is a medical gas um we administer it when we we suspect hypoxia or hypoxemia also um or the uh, if we suspect it or if the patient actually is complaining of uh any type of uh, difficulty breathing, or you see them in actually uh, difficulty or in respiratory distress. Okay. Um, also, if the patient is showing signs, signs and symptoms of shock, we give them oxygen. Okay. And then finally, if the pulse box is under 94%. Now, did we talk about some precautions to take with, with oxygen? I don't think we did. Okay. Did Paul go over any precautions with oxygen? Well, when he said with the tank to be careful with it. Not to drop it. It's dropped. Not to lever, leave it unattended. Did he say just the tank itself? That's all he said. <clears throat> Okay. First off, oxygen is an oxidizer. It actually promotes uh, fire growth. Okay. Having an open flame near uh, open oxygen will ca cause combustion, will cause an explosion. So nasal cannulas on noses and uh, lighting a, a, um, a cigarette, not a very good idea. Number one. Uh, number two, that oxygen, that gas, actually interacts with oils. So you never use oil around oxygen. And I'm not talking about cooking oil, although you got to be careful about heating that up too. But uh, what, what people have done in the past, and there's been bad consequences as a result, is that the, the oil on tape can cause an explosion. And, and the way they, they usually do that is they'll tape the stem 
and that's the silver piece where you put the regulator, they'll tape it around there to, to, and they'll write like, like dead or empty or something. And that's the worst thing that you could do. Okay. Uh, because that's going to cause a chemical reaction and cause an explosion. All right. Um, what else? Yeah, you don't want to you don't want to leave it uh, standing up uh, unless you, you put it in a crate. You saw the crate in the in the in the in the lab room. You guys seen it? I don't think I did. No. Okay. Well, there's a crate in there where you put oxygen bottles. And that that has um, rods in there to keep the bottles upright, so they're not going to topple over. Uh, when you just leave it up like that, then um, then it falls down. It could break off that stem, and now you have a missile. Literally, you have all that pressure within that bottle that uh, the oxygen tanks have been on to go through cinder block walls. Um, so, <coughs> uh, we, we have to be very, very careful with, with those bottles. And um, we kind of talked about the, the, the pin system for, for auction regulator and for an auction bottle. To make sure you can't put something else in there, how it's identified by the by the green color. Um, what else? That's about it. Okay, so uh, we we've talked about what too much oxygen can do to to the body. Uh, it, it actually have have found that. It, it, it is a lot more damage, it causes a lot more damage to the heart. They've actually found that patients that had heart attacks that were given high amounts of oxygen or even uh, given oxygen when they didn't need it uh, actually made the, the, the injury worse and they actually had a poor outcome to the point where they didn't get discharged from the hospital. Uh, they, they, they died at the hospital. So it does uh, reduce the blood flow in the heart itself. And then uh, we've talked about uh, the free radical production. Um, hey, Lou, have you seen these? What? These right here. These little I bottles. What, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm trying to show them to you. Look, uh, if you can see my camera. Because it says oxygen. Do, is it the same thing as the bottle or is that – have you ever seen those? I, I, I couldn't really see it to tell you. It says nine it, – it also says 95% oxygen. Okay. I, I've seen soccer players like in the middle of like just straight up just inhale that. Uh huh. And I don't know. I, I mean, I see them like if if it's really good. So I don't know if too much of that. I mean, how much is too much? Does that? That's my question, I guess. It really depends. I mean, if there's nothing wrong with you, oxygen's not really going to get you. Well, I can't say that. Um. How can I put it? The reason soccer players are doing it is, remember, they're running a lot. And they're trying to catch their breath. They, 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 they need a lot more stamina. Um, you know, for me, I literally, I've been sitting in this chair since 2 o'clock this afternoon. Um, I was sitting in my office chair yesterday till midnight. So... I spent a lot of time sitting down. Obviously, I don't need oxygen. 
I need to get my ass up, but um, I don't. Um, and so whether it's good or bad, uh, as long as you're not having something wrong with you, uh, the only thing that really worries me is there has to be some chemicals in there to create that oxygen. Or there has to be some sort of chemical reaction to create that oxygen. So. Okay. All right. Um, so, as far as uh, watching the amount of oxygen we give we uh, to medical patients, yeah, medical patients, we we have to be very careful. Um, however, with trauma patients, what we have to do is they're the ones that that need the oxygen. Um, There's bleeding going on with them. So uh, we need to make sure that the body's going to have enough oxygen uh, to deliver with the, the available blood that, that is there. So we're, we're kind of saturating the, the, the blood with oxygen in this particular case. Okay. Any questions with, with oxygen? Uh, no. <clears throat> no. All right, next up is oral glucose. Now, this is a particular type of glucose. Glucose, obviously, we know sugar, but this is oral glucose, where it, it's found in the tube. Um, and you guys saw the, the, the oral glucose tubes. Uh, they come 15 grams of, of glucose in that tube. Now, we know that the brain needs glucose means an uninterrupted supply that's why the brain doesn't require any insulin to um to get the the sugar out of the bloodstream to to be used for for energy production because it needs to get in there now um for oral glucose primarily used on diabetics when the blood sugar is low it, it's a quick way to get some something into them until they can have a meal, um, because for whatever reason, maybe it's going to take a little bit for them to bank their meal or anything. Um, and for first aid, you know, oh yeah, let me whip you up some some steak and eggs real quick, or uh, egg and egg and hash browns. You know, that's not going to happen. So it's a quick temporary fix. Now, for oral glucose, I'm trying to remember, maybe that's why they don't talk about it. Um, what's a contraindication for oral glucose? A what? Well, they can't have it if they're unresponsive. Okay. And why is that? They can block the airway. They can't, they're not awake to swallow. They're not conscious. All 
Write down by me again. Well, I could like block their airway if they're not awake enough or conscious enough to, to swallow. So they can't, they can't protect their own airway, so they can't go <laughs> if something goes back there. So, yeah. So they have to be conscious in order to give them uh, oral glucose, and the reason being is they have to be able to protect their own airway. Uh, a rule of thumb is is put it in their hand. If they can hold it in their hand, they, they can take that oral glucose. Okay. So. Something that's not used very much anymore is activated charcoal. Um, before somebody took something they weren't supposed to, uh, actually even before that, uh, you guys remember syrup of Epicac or anybody, any, anyone given that when they were young? Nope. No. No. Okay. Syrup of Epicac was given to, to uh, induce vomiting, but with all the chemicals and everything out there, it, it's kind of, nobody uses it anymore. I think they even have it off store shelves now. Nobody uses it. Um, but the other thing that's given now too, although that's not used very often, there, there's still some places that use it, um, but there's a lot of places that don't, is activated charcoal. Um, activated charcoal is just what it sounds like. It's charcoal. It, it's it's a, They grind it down. It's a black powder, and, and they put it into a suspension. And basically, it's it's a liquid liquid form. So they put the, the charcoal powder inside the, the, the container with fluid in it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so the patient drinks it. But as we know, charcoal is black. And so what do you think their tongue and their teeth and their lips are going to turn? Black. They're going to turn black. And then they go number two. And what do you think is going to happen there? It'll be black. <laughs> this will also be black. Yeah. What charcoal does, it actually binds to the chemical, or the chemical binds to the charcoal. So um, they ingest the poison, then they ingest the charcoal, and that charcoal is going to absorb the poison, uh, causing the chemical to, to bind to it. Um, and that way, it doesn't get absorbed to the body via the bowels or even to the stomach. It also has contraindications when we can't use it. And we'll talk about that later. But um, the problem with giving a person activated charcoal, and that's one of those that, that can be carried on your ambulance. That's not something that they might have at home, is getting the patient to swallow it because it tastes horrible. And on Monday, uh, I'll show you guys a, a bottle. Um, it actually has the, the uh, like a cherry flavoring that you could put inside the bottle to help it make it taste better. But without it, it tastes horrible. Not that I've ever tried it with a cherry, but. Um, the next medication we need to know about is aspirin. Aspirin is a anticoagulant. In other words, it, it prevents clotting of the blood. And so when somebody's having chest pain or discomfort, which we'll talk more about it, what, next week or the week after when we do cardiac emergencies, um, what's going to happen is that the blood starts to pool in an area and then it clots up. And that's going to cause more issues. So the reason we give patients aspirin is to help prevent a clot, therefore uh, preventing further blockage of the of the blood flow in that artery. Um, Bayer, several years ago, they were advertising that uh, when a heart attack comes on, take a Bayer aspirin to help prevent a heart attack. And so they had to they had to pull those ads because no, it doesn't prevent a heart attack. So a little bit misleading. 
again, we're trying to prevent any further uh, blood flow issues, but there's a lot of other blood vessels where it can still occur. Um, Uh, the next ones are the inhaled bronchodilators, the, the albuterols, the atrovents, the singulars, all that stuff. Um, and we de we primarily deal with the, the meter dose inhalers, which also have spacers. Uh, meter dose inhalers are, are prescribed to the patient um, that have chronic respiratory conditions, so things like asthma, COPD. Um, As ENTs, we're able to uh, assist and or administer these bronchodilators. Uh, uh, uh. It, it's usually just, uh, just albuterol. Um, the, the contraindications or the things that can get you in trouble are, are, are minimal for albuterol. There's others like Atrovent where you have to remember you can't give it to kids. So it gets a little bit more involved. Um, so the, the common uh, inhaler medication that, that we utilize is called albuterol. And later on we'll find out, but that's a generic name, albuterol. Okay. Uh, then you have the small volume nebulizer uh same things uh it's it's used to administer the albuterol uh it's just a regular nebulizer or i, sh I shouldn't say regular nebulizer uh you guys saw the nebulizer paul showed you the nebulizer yeah so you just put the the uh the medication within the nebulizer and uh, you attach it to oxygen you give it to the patient to breathe now, the thing about nebulizers is there's discussion about discontinuing those uh, because of COVID. Because as the patient is exhaling, what's occurring is the, uh, the virus uh, may be found in, the, in those droplets. And somebody walks by that or you're close to it and you inhale that, now you're inhaling the COVID. Okay. Questions? No. Nope. Um, next step is natural glycerin. Uh, natural glycerin is used by cardiac patients. Uh, and the reason being is that it opens up blood vessels. It causes vasodilation. Have we talked about natural before? Okay. We talked about it um, the day of the, when he showed us, he kind of talked about it that time. It was a little bit, but that was it. Yeah. What did, did yeah. he showed it to you, or who showed it to you? Yeah, um, it, was it the small little one? The the natural, yeah. Yeah. Oh remember? yeah. Yeah, yeah. You you went over and gave like this little tiny one that you put under the tongue, and then you have to put it on the little cap thing, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But I didn't do that with everybody. I only did it with oh, okay. one group. Um. So natural glycerin, like I said, is a vasodilator. It opens up the blood vessels. It is because of that action that we have to check to make sure that a patient is not on any erectile dysfunction drugs. Because what's going to occur is with natural glycerin, first off, you're, you're opening up the blood vessels, right? So in other words, you're making the container bigger. But does the volume change? Remember we've talked about that with, with shock? Or not shock, but when we talked about um, Pathophys chapter eight.
Okay, so the volume doesn't change. Um, and then um, you give medication like Viagra, you just made the container even bigger. You vasodilated the blood vessel some more. Again, we go back to the issue of did the volume change? No, it didn't. So remember the whole uh, Starling's law where the greater the stretch, the greater the force of the contractions. So if the blood vessels are so open, but that blood that's in the body right now is not enough to even push those uh, upon those blood vessels, what's your blood pressure going to be like? It's going to be low. So, um, so we have to be be aware of, of of nitro and what medicines they're on, or they may be on. Um, and then, lastly, is actually not two more. Uh, then we have epinephrine, adrenaline, and we talked about opening up the blood vessels, the beta one, beta two. And then finally, we have Narcan. Narcan is, a, is what we call a narcotic antagonist. In other words, it fights against the opiates or the narcotics. Uh, it, competes, it competes for the uh, receptor sites on the nerves that the narcotic is, is taking over right now. And it will literally boot it out of that receptor site. It's kind of like somebody sitting in a car and somebody comes up to you and takes you out of your car and they, they take your car. It's the same thing. The narcotic is, is driving the car, but here comes the Narcan to try to get that car back, goes in and gets the, the driver out and it takes, it takes its place. And then it locks the door so they can't get back in. Although eventually the, the Narcan is going to weaken and, and then the narcotic, if they took enough of it, can come back in and cause cause the problems again. So, um, I don't remember if I showed you guys the video of bringing out the dead, but I don't think so. Um, so we use Narcan as a way to treat suspected opioid overdose. If we don't know if if it is, although looking at the pupils can tell us because their pupils are going to be very very constricted. Um, we can go ahead and administer it. Uh, Narcan now is available over the counter. So you could just go to your local pharmacy and, and get some, although you'll probably spend, I don't know, around 75 bucks for it. Um, the thing about Narcan is also can, can reverse respiratory depression, even respiratory arrest. That, that's how effective Narcan is. All right, questions, comments? All right, take a 10 minute break.